when Joel um, asked me to do this teaching, he was like, it's going to be on the discipline of church. And I was like, well, he just did an awesome teaching on it a couple of months ago. Um, and I'm going to be preaching to the choir because the people that come to church on a Wednesday night are people that already have a conviction about the importance of church, right? Um, but I don't usually say no to a teaching opportunity. So I was like, okay, fine, I'll do it. Um, and it was an opportunity for me to kind of um, ponder and work through some things that I've already been thinking about the, the nature of the church for a, several years, actually, based on a message I heard years ago at a conference. Um, and so I'm excited to dig into this tonight. Um, my heart behind this is to encourage us that church is important, obviously. Um, but I know all of you have some sense of that importance because you're here tonight. But also to equip us. Because how many of you know somebody who professes Christ but does not prioritize church in their lives? Does anybody know anybody like that? Um, so I feel like this is, you know, church is very out of fashion. It's very politically incorrect. It's considered irrelevant, antiquated, um, and unnecessary, really, in our culture today. Even among Christians in our culture, church, physical church, is kind of like an afterthought. And it's not considered a necessity. So my goal tonight is that we would all be equipped to maybe talk with those people in our lives in a fresh way um, and to... Um, be able to dialogue with them and encourage them of the importance of church. So let's pray and we will get started. Lord, thank you that you have called us each here tonight and that you have, um, that you've given us a church, Lord, that teaches your word um, with pastors that love you and walk uprightly, God, um, that we have fellowship with one another. What we have is so precious. And I know that people around the globe and throughout history um, would literally die for this, Lord, and are dying for this. And um, may we never take it for granted. May we consider it as precious as you consider it, God, and stir our hearts up tonight. Speak through me. um, Shut my mouth from saying anything that's not from you. And um, would you just be glorified and magnified? In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so to start off, don't look at your questions because I inadvertently put some of the answers on here. But um, partner up with someone next to you or three people or whatever and see if you can um, think of some metaphors or pictures that the Bible uses to describe the church. So like a metaphor or a picture. So we know like for Jesus, Jesus is the bread of life. He's not literally like a piece of bread. That's a metaphor, um, a picture to show us something about Jesus. Jesus is the light of the world. What is the church in the Bible? All right, ready, set, go. Discuss with someone next to you. All right, so wrap up those conversations. (laughs) What did you ladies come up with? Just shout out some of them. The Bride of Christ. The Bride of Christ. The Body of Christ. Lights. Family. They're, yeah, lights of the world, right? A family. Uh-huh. Anything else? Sheep of this pastor. Sheep. Mm-hmm. So there's actually, like, I don't know. I mean, I guess I Googled it multiple times. There's multiple lists of different metaphors in the Bible, but I think there's around, like, seven that are consistent throughout Scripture. Um, we're only going to cover four tonight. Um, and we're not going to cover the body because we have covered that in depth in 1 Corinthians. So, but we are going to talk about four different pictures that the Bible gives us for what the church is. Those are going to help us discover um, the nature of relationships within the church. And um, yeah, so let's, and then we're going to talk about problems that arise between like God's perfect design, what he intended for the church to be, and our reality today in our world. And then we're going to just talk about some practical solutions 
um, for each of those pictures that we can live out in our lives. So the first picture I want us to talk about is the first, well, they're all relationships. They're all relational. The first one is very relational. It's the church is a flock. The church is a flock. And um, we know throughout the Old Testament that God refers to David as the shepherd who would um, shepherd the shepherd his people Israel. He condemns the wicked shepherds um, of Israel in the prophetic books. Of course, Jesus is the good shepherd in the New Testament. And then Paul applies this image in the book of Acts when he's speaking to the Ephesian elders. In Acts 20, 28 and on, it says, um, he said, therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore, watch. So Paul commissions the elders at the church in Ephesus um, to shepherd the flock of God that was among them. Peter also uses this picture in 1 Peter 5, 2 through 4. Um, he addresses the elders who are among you. And he says, shepherd the flock of God, which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, not as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. So again, we have that picture of a flock. The church is a flock. Now, as we think about that, there are some observations that arise. That's a collective term, right? It's not that he just purchased individual sheep and they're all just out there on their own little field. It's a flock. There's, there's a collective, collectivity. There's a unity there. Um, and then we see that a flock is in need of shepherding. We're not just supposed to be wild, feral sheep running around a hillside, but we need a shepherd. And so God has ordained, in these passages, it even says that the Holy Spirit has appointed shepherds and overseers of the flock. Um, So this is different than just a Bible teacher. There are many Bible teachers available to us online, wherever. Um, This implies a relationship with the sheep, right? The shepherd knows his sheep. He has an ongoing, daily, consistent relationship with his sheep. Um, The verb translated shepherd to shepherd the flock of God is to feed, to nourish, to rule over, to govern, to supply the needs of that, the soul. Um, And David goes, breaks it down and he says, there's two main jobs of a shepherd, a spiritual shepherd. The first is to feed the sheep with the word of God, right? To nurture them. Um, And another is to tend the sheep to guard them, to protect them. Even in Paul's address to the Ephesians, he says that there will be wolves that will come in to try to seek to draw away uh, members of the flock. So um, the flock is vulnerable to predators, to wolves, to false doctrines, um, to wolves in sheep's clothing. And we also know that um, from the first Peter passage that the sheep need real life examples to follow. So not only are our shepherds to feed us, to nurture us, to watch over us, to guard us and protect us, but they serve as examples for us to follow. Um, And they are all told to shepherd the flock of God, which is among them. So this implies relational and physical proximity to the sheep. They can't shepherd from afar. Um, They have to do it. They have to get their hands dirty, get in there with the sheep. This is God's design for the church. This is one of those pictures that gives us insight into what God intended for the church to be and to have. Um, Unfortunately, today, there's a disconnect between that and the reality of many believers. Um, Some of the problems that I think that we encounter, and I'm supposed to make this like applicable to women, but I think that these these problems are pretty universal. Um, So look at it with your woman lens. I don't know. Um, But... The, one of the problems is that great teaching is accessible to us without having to have physical proximity to a shepherd, right? You can podcast some of the best preachers in the country, in the world, at the drop of a finger, and you don't have to be in relationship with them. They don't have to know anything about you. Um, there are disadvantages to that, though. Um, it can be easy to listen to or stream church services and think that that counts as church, um, but... We know from scripture that church requires shepherds, right? It requires that relationship of shepherding. 
Um, we might also, because there's so much good teaching out there, we might unfairly compare like celebrity pastors, famous pastors to our local pastors. And I actually have a friend who, who did this for a long time. She was like, oh, I don't want to go to church because they're not as good as Matt Chandler. And I'm like, that's really unfair. <laughs> like, you need a shepherd in your life, like in physical proximity to you. Um, so they might not be as funny or as relatable or whatever. But that's not, God doesn't really care about that. God wants you in a, in a shepherd, be, to be shepherded in a local flock. Um, another problem that we have is that bad teaching is really easily accessible to us online, right? And I mean, there are a lot of bad women teachers out there <laughs> who are promoting doctrines that are dangerous, that are heretical. Um, and as women, we need to be really vigilant against influencers and who we're following because we're supposed to be following shepherds, not just good women Bible teachers. Now, I listen to women Bible teachers. I love Jen Wilkin. I love different people that are famous and that are adhere to the word of God, but they're not my shepherds. That's supplementary, right? That's in addition to being in a church congregation. We need shepherds in, in our real lives to help protect us from these wolves. Um, and another problem is that our American culture has really undermined the role of authority, right? Like, and even with, as women, we might have like disregard or even downright disgust for like male leadership in the church. That might be an issue. Um, and sometimes this is fallout from terrible, um, abuses of power, sexual abuse, things like that. Sometimes it's just an issue in our own hearts where we don't want to submit to authority, um, or we don't like God's established authority of like men being pastors. And so we like buck against that. Um, so all of these can separate us physically and relationally from having real life shepherds in our lives. So some practical solutions for this. Um, God has designed us to be under the care of shepherds who feed us and oversee us. So one way to do that is to be physically present at the gathering of the church, at the gathering of the flock. Um, you can't just do church with your family for a sustained period of time. You can intake Bible teaching. You can do worship as a family, but um, church requires shepherds. So long term, you have to be under the shepherding of, um, of a teacher, an elder, shepherd and elder. Um, another thing is not just be physically present, but build relationships with the shepherds in your life. We have amazing pastors at our church, and um, our church is small enough that we actually can get to know them. We can sit with them at the barbecue. You can get to know their wives. Um, you can volunteer to serve in ministries where you'll be rubbing shoulders with them and get to know them. You can go to the mission study and hang out at Pastor Trent's house and get to know him as your shepherd. Um, you can ask them to pray for you. They'll get to know you that way. Um, you can watch how they live their lives, how they parent their children, how they treat their wives, um, and follow those examples, those good examples. Um, another thing that we have to do is actually trust and follow the leadership of our shepherds. <laughs> so this is where like the rubber meets the road. My dad is an assistant pastor at a big church in Arizona, and he does a ton of counseling, mostly marriage counseling, um, but all kinds of counseling. And he's like, the problem is that people just don't do what I tell them to do. I tell them like, you know, go home and tell your wife you love her and pray for her, like pray for her three times in a week. And they come back and he's like, well, did you pray for them three times? No. Well, I can't help you if you're not going to do that. So when our pastors and shepherds tell us things, follow it. Um, this, this is God's design for us as the church. Um, and lastly, pray for them, especially when you disagree with them. Pray for them first because they're, they're fallible. They're not going to live up to every expectation we have for them. And that's okay. They weren't intended to. We have a good, perfect shepherd who's the perfect shepherd. Uh, we follow imperfect shepherds who are doing their best. And so we pray for them. We intercede for them. If you think that they're doing something wrong, that they're making a mistake, pray for them. Um, and if you have experienced church hurt or spiritual abuse, um, you're a sheep who's been mistreated by a cruel and hypocritical shepherd. And that happens. Unfortunately, that happens. And unfortunately, it's always happened because God addressed that in Ezekiel 34. You can look at this later in your own time. But he has strict judgment for the shepherds who were not feeding his sheep, who were out for their own gain, and they were using the sheep for their own gain. Um, so he cares. He sees, and he knows that. 
And I would suggest to you that the best place for healing from spiritual abuse is under the care of a good shepherd. It's in a healthy flock with healthy, good shepherds. Um, A wounded sheep isn't going to survive very long out on its own in the wilderness, right? But if a good shepherd comes and takes care of it and nurtures it and sets those broken bones or, um, you know, gives it the nourishment that it's lacking, that sheep will heal and will thrive. The same is true with us. And for people that you know in your lives, if they've been wounded, encourage them to get into a church. They don't need therapy. They don't need to take time off from church. They need to be under the care of a good shepherd. And that's available to us here in America in 2023. We can find good shepherds out there. Um, So bad shepherds will always exist, but so will good shepherds. Um, And then when Jesus comes, he'll dismantle the whole system and he'll be the perfect shepherd. So the first picture was the flock of God. The next picture that we're going to look at is the church is the bride of Christ. So this, um, I want to point out kind of how church benefits our relationship with the Lord. This idea of being the bride of Christ permeates throughout scripture. Once again, we see this... um, Throughout the Old Testament, the book of Hosea talks a lot about um, God's people being his bride. Isaiah talks about it. I had so many scriptures that I had to cut out because we don't have time, but they're so good. Um, Paul talks about it. John talks about it in the book of Revelation. Um, But we're going to look at the passage in Ephesians 5, 23 through 32. And it tells us what the church should be like. And we usually read it as a marriage passage. um, because it is very practical. But I want us to read it as a passage talking about the church tonight. So Ephesians 5, 23 through 32. Um, If you want to, you can turn there because it's a little bit longer. It says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So men ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loves himself, for no man ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, even as the Lord the church. Um, And then coming down to verse 32, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So again, some things to note from this passage. There's a love relationship between the bride, which is the church, and the groom, which is Christ. He gave himself up for her. And according to this passage, the bride needs to be cleansed. She needs to be nurtured. She needs to be washed with the water of the word. She needs to be loved. If you think about a bride on her wedding day, usually it's like the most beautiful she's ever been, right? She has this glow. She's probably spent months preparing for that because she probably had like unwanted body hair or blemishes she needed to get facials for. She might have gotten like a fake tan, gotten her hair done. Um, She's glowing because she's been cleansed. She's been beautified. She's been glorified, right? Um, This is the beautification that we, as the bride of Christ, um, need, and it's only going to be fulfilled by our groom, by Jesus Christ himself. And God has established church to be a means for that to happen, Yes, Bible reading is important. We have to have our own relationships with the Lord. Going to small group Bible studies is important. But church, the church gathering is another means by which God has ordained for that to happen. There's, we are the, the bride of Christ, not a bunch of little brides, right? Together, we're the bride of Christ. Um, so this is God's design for the church. But there are often things that come in the way, problems that we face that um, get in between that being our greatest reality. So um, as I was kind of brainstorming this one, I was thinking how other relationships often take the priority over this relationship with our groom through the church gathering. So um, sometimes, you know, single ladies, it's, it can feel alienating to come to church. It can feel like I don't have anybody to sit with or, you know, sometimes church might feel like it's geared towards couples or towards families and you might feel alienated. You might feel left out. Um, Sometimes wives come who don't have believing husbands and they're like, there's conflict at home. There's contention about them coming to church. You might even have a believing husband and there may be a point of contention between coming to church and staying home and things like that. Um, Sometimes our children are the thing that come between us and getting to church, right? Like that there's a lot of logistical challenges that come with getting kids to church every single week. And it doesn't always feel worth it for all that effort. Um, 
our kids have church hangovers afterwards, you know, and it's like, oh my gosh, they missed a nap. They're like crazy afterwards. Um, so another thing that can happen is extended family can plan things during church times and you're expected to be there because they're family, you know, your family. Um, and then just our own hearts. We can have apathy towards the Lord, apathy towards our groom and be like, oh, we feel like it. Um, so some practical solutions that I have for you for this one are to bring to the Lord your emotional needs, your emotional desires. He will not disappoint you. Nancy Guthrie said, our less than perfect marriages or our longings to be married can serve to whet our appetite for this perfect marriage to come. Whether we're married or single, divorced or widowed, our lives are meant to be spent nurturing our longing for this better marriage. She's speaking of our ultimate consummation in heaven with Jesus. Don't stuff down those desires to be loved in this way. Direct your desires toward the only one who can love you in this way forever. Um, so if you're single and you wish you had someone to come to church with, text a friend, meet up with them at church, sit with them at church, and um, have accountability there. Say like, hey, keep me accountable to come to church, um, even if I don't feel like it. Um, go to church with or without your husband. Go. Um, this is where we have to fear and reverence the Lord even more than our earthly relationships. Um, it might be difficult. It might be emotionally draining. You might feel weird about it, um, but do it anyways. It might require forethought and planning to get your kids to church on time. I heard of a mom who dressed her kids in their Sunday morning clothes on Saturday night and put them to bed. <laughs> and then they just had to wake up and like her husband was in ministry. And so she was getting all these little kids to church by herself. And they woke up in their church clothes and she just put them in the car with like breakfast. And they, she made it to church. She made it happen. There are ways we can make it happen. We have so much influence in our homes and in our families. Um, and this is the most important relationship to nurture, to prioritize above anything else. This relationship with our groom. Um, the next picture I wanted to bring out is the picture of the household of God. We could also interchangeably say the family of God. Um, and this is where we see the relationships that we have with one another as God intended them to be in the church. So um, there are many references to the church being the house of God, like talking about a building, the temple of the Holy Spirit, um, things like that. But I want us to, I wanted to direct us to this nuanced picture of the household of God. This word in Greek is only used two times in the New Testament, both by Paul relating to the church. And it says in Ephesians 2, 19, Now therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Galatians six ten says, Therefore, um, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. So some, some observations for this one. In that Ephesians 2 passage, Paul is contrasting um, that without Christ, of, apart from Christ, we Gentiles especially were foreigners and aliens. We were strangers from God. But now through Christ, we have been brought in and now we're members, we're fellow citizens and members of the household of God. The word household carries that term or that idea of belonging. This is where you belong. You fit in. Um, in Christ, we belong to God's family and to his household. We're adopted, we're secure, we're wanted, we're valued in his family and in his household. And um, this is true not just of like God's large church, God's large family um, at large, but even down to every local congregation and gathering. You belong Satan would love to come and tell you, you don't belong, you don't fit in, nobody really likes you, you belong. Because the scripture says that you belong. This is why Calvary chapels don't have membership. Because they believe that Christians belong to the household of God. And so you belong to church when you come here. You are a member. Um, however, this isn't always a reality in our lives. Or it doesn't always feel like a reality in our lives. Because families are messy, right? We don't get to pick who is in God's household. Um, it'd be great if we could like hand pick who we wanted at a church and then just plop down with them and live our lives perfectly happy without any conflict or um, different personalities or anything like that. But that's not how God has designed it. He has specifically placed people in our household to help us to grow, to rub us the wrong way so that we can get rid of those rough edges, those areas of sin, and to, um, to, 
uh, sanctify us, to purify us. Families have conflict, and sometimes the people closest to us can hurt us the most deeply, right? Sometimes you can get hurt by people in church more deeply than you're even hurt by like your own family members. Um, and we don't always feel like we belong. We may come and think like, oh, I don't think that they really want me here. I'm not part of the in crowd, whatever. Um, we consider an easy solution to conflict to be to just move to a different church <laughs> congregation. Like, okay, well, I don't really like these people or they don't seem to like me. I'm having trouble with these people. There's a church down the road. I'll just go there. Um, there can be valid reasons to go to other churches, but unresolved conflict with people in the household of God is not one of those things. Um, it's not one of those reasons. So some practical solutions to these problems. When your feelings or the enemy tempt you to believe that you don't belong, return to this truth that you belong. This is your household. It's your family for better or for worse. Work hard to love those that you wouldn't have picked to be in this household in the first place. God does some of his most transformative work in our lives um, when we work through issues that we have with other people in the household of God. If you're jealous of someone at church, it's not their problem, it's your problem, right? If I don't like someone at church because of their personality or their weaknesses they have or immaturities that they have or their style or their age, it's not a problem with them, it's a problem with me. Um, and so practically speaking, stay at a church for the long haul. Work hard. Work out those difficult relationships. Um, when you're part of the weekly gatherings of the household, flip around the narrative and your feelings of not belonging to, oh, I bet that person doesn't feel welcome. I bet that person needs a, a greeting from somebody. Flip it around so that you're not looking for people to serve you, but you're like the hostess. This is your house, and you go out and greet them. You go out and say hi. You go out and initiate relationships with people. This is your household, you belong, so let others feel that belonging as well. Welcome other people into that belonging. I am by nature a very shy person. I would prefer to never meet new people. Um, but from my teenage years, God has convicted me that I can't be like that. I'm not allowed to be like that at church. I have to say hi to people. I have to initiate relationships with people. And the longer you do it, the easier it gets. It's not as painful as it was many, many years ago for me. Um, Jesus said, by this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Okay, and then the last picture is kind of an obscure one, but it's one that I love. It's in 1 Timothy 3.15. The picture is that the church is the pillar and ground of truth. So turn to 1 Timothy 3.15 because this isn't as popular of a picture. First Timothy 3.15, Paul says, If I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. So we think of a pillar, it's something that props up like the roof of a building, right? Um, or a porch or whatever. The ground is like the foundation. It's the basis that everything else is built upon. And it says in this verse that the church is the... Um, Pillar and ground of truth. So pillars were actually used in ancient times, not just to hold up parts of the building, but they actually used to issue, like when they would issue proclamations, they would post it on a pillar so that everybody could see. It was a way of disseminating information, disseminating the news, laws, whatever. Um, so that's what the church is to be in our culture. Isn't that a cool picture? Um, if you think about like, all, like ancient architecture, that's left today. So I was thinking of the Forum in Rome. And um, it's this huge, I mean, I don't know, like an acre, two acres, whatever, of ancient ruins. They're thousands of years old. And as you walk through there, what's left are not buildings. They're not walls. What's left are pillars and foundations. And there are pillars that are still standing thousands of years later. I've been to many ancient ruins like in Europe, and there are often pillars left. The building's destroyed, the roof is destroyed, the pillar's still there, and the foundation is still there, which I think is a really good picture for us of the truth that we have in the church. The, truth, the church doesn't make the truth, but it proclaims the truth, and it's a way that the truth is um, disseminated to the culture around it. Um, the truth doesn't change. Customs change, cultures change, um, philosophies, 
acceptable morals change, lifestyles change, right? Um, with the culture around them. But all those things will eventually crumble and fall. What's left is the truth, the unchanging truth of God's word. And um, we need the truth that the gathering of the church provides as much as the world needs it because we're bombarded with the lies of the world, right? The church is to be a bulwark against deception, self-deception, the deception of the culture around us, even spiritual deception. This is why we need the gathering of the church. This is God's design for the church. But what are the problems? What are the things that come in between that? Well, the Bible describes three huge influences that come against us. The world, that's the culture. The flesh, that's our worldly, fleshly, sinful desires. And the devil. All those voices are loud and they're coming against us. We need the truth of scripture as proclaimed in church to fight those lies. And a lot of times we don't feel like hearing the truth. Just on a practical note, even if you're a strong believer, you might not feel like hearing the truth. Um, several, a couple weeks ago when Trent was doing, Pastor Trent was doing the teaching on one life to, you have one life, what was it? One life to, li- how did he say it? Yeah, well, what is it? Only one life. Only what's done for Christ. Only what's done for Christ will last. Thank you. I've got like, yes. Only what's done for Christ will last. So I'll, I'm going to confess to you guys. I heard that and I was like, I don't want to go. I am living with metastatic breast cancer. I don't want to hear that I only have one life to live. My flesh was like, no, that's all you think about. You think about your mortality enough. You don't need to go hear that. And I was like, can I be sick today? <laughs> can I not feel good? Can I not come? But you know what? I have to hear that. I have to subject myself to the truth because what happens is we start, we get self-deceived and we start thinking, well, I don't need to like live as if this is my last month or my last year or whatever. Um, or, or, well, since this is my last year, I'm just going to live it up. I'm going to do whatever I want to do. I don't care what the Lord wants me to do. I've served him enough. I'm just going to like go out, you know, partying or whatever. Um, we have to subject ourselves to the truth, put ourselves in the position to receive that truth, to combat the lies. When I was going through chemotherapy the, the first time, there were so many times when I could have just stayed home because I didn't feel like 100%. Um, and I came to church anyways. And I wouldn't say anything necessarily like magical happened. It wasn't like, oh, I came home feeling so encouraged. Or, you know, I was going through like extreme anxiety, despair, fear, depression. Many of you guys know that. Um, And church proclaimed the truth. It said, your feelings are not the truth. God's word is the truth. God loves you. God has a plan. God has hope for you. That's stronger than your feelings. Um, That's hard. That's hard to do. Our feelings, we have to bring our feelings under our rule not allow our feelings to rule whether we'll go to church or not. Um, And so just, you know, some even seeing like people worshiping the Lord together that I'd seen go through horrible trials, that boosted my faith. It bolstered my faith. Um, An acquaintance who I really don't even know, she's like a Facebook friend. I don't know her. She um, messaged me. I knew her. I met her one time for like a week. She messaged me recently and she got diagnosed with breast cancer and she goes, Um, She's about my age, and she's like, I just want to know how you kept your faith in the midst of that, because I feel like my faith is, like, being very shaken by this. And so I was kind of like, I don't don't know. And as I was thinking, I, I told her, go to church. Stay in fellowship. Be at church as much as you physically can, because that will um, anchor you and speak the truth to your feelings. Um, So some practical things. When you get home tonight, you can open up your Google Calendar or write on your calendar church every single week. You can have be a recurring event in your calendar. This is um, Amy's tip. And then if people try to invite you to things or if you feel, don't feel like going, you already have a prior obligation that you have to keep. Well, I said I was going to go to church. You know, your family invites you to a birthday party. Well, I could go after church, but I already have church scheduled. Um, whether you feel like it or not. Um, Let's see, what are my other ones? Oh, yeah, um, sign up to volunteer for a ministry at church. That's an okay reason for to, to volunteer at church to, for the accountability. I do that for myself. If I feel like I need to study the Bible, you know what I do? I host a Bible study at my house. 
then I have to do it. I have no excuse. I can't bail out. Um, I do often do that for myself as much as I do it for other people. Um, treat church with the same importance as you treat a job, as you treat school. It's more important. You don't not show up to work because you don't feel like it. Your boss would fire you, right? You can't just be like, I didn't really feel like going today, or I didn't really feel like I needed to. No, you show up because that's your commitment, and you're required to do that. Go to the pillar and ground of truth, whether you feel like it or not. Okay, um, have the same priority, the same importance towards that. Um, and then this is a shameless plug for two ministries that I'm involved in. We have our Inspired Motherhood Ministry, which is starting up again on Saturday morning, because we need the truth of God's word in our parenting, not the lies and the trends of our culture. We need to build our families on the foundation of God's word, that unchangeable truth. So go to that, invite friends to that. Um, and then the other is our marriage ministry, which is starting up in a couple weeks, February 3rd, I think. Um, that's where we you know, look at what the Bible says about marriage. And if you don't feel like remaining committed to your marriage, because, and the culture says, you don't really need to, just bail, it's hard. No, the Bible says to stay faithful, to continue in those hard things. And so um, both of those ministries exist to equip us um, to filter uh, the the world's, you know, philosophies and ideas through the lens of Scripture so that we we can have families that glorify and honor the Lord. So the church is the pillar and ground of truth. Okay, so what was the first picture? The flock. The next picture? Bride of Christ. Next picture. Household of God. Last one. Pillar and ground of truth. Okay. So now we're going to get into our small groups and discuss. So now you can look at your questions on the back. Yes. Uh, did you get the bulletin? Okay. I have one extra. People in your group will. Um, and if we need more, I can take a picture for you or something. So get into groups. I think we'll probably be able to have like maybe three groups. Um, Maybe one can meet up here, one can meet in the back corner, and then you guys can all be a group right there and discuss these questions.